Good evening. Um, <clears throat> we've been looking at Daniel. We're going to look at Daniel 3 today. Now, before we go to Daniel 3, um, I don't know, how, but anybody experienced anxiety before? You know, anxiety makes you do things that you really didn't want to do or do you, want, you do not want to do sometimes. And um, it kind of gets you out of control, out of your comfort zone when you have experience with anxiety. And, um, you know, there's many reasons that we have anxiety. There could be um, lack of neurotransmitters or deficiency with neurotransmitters or, or imbalances in our bodies. Um, maybe could be experiences that we face that w we recollect. Um, there's some other things that, that cause anxiety in our lives. Um, maybe lack some expectations that are not met and we're just, how do we handle those things? So when ha somebody has anxiety, he starts doing things that really are not normal. Um, I explained in a class that there was this man that came here and he had so much anxiety that he thought he was going to die. And, you know, he had no problem, but he was not able to figure out that he had no problem. His anxiety took over and it was too hard for him to, to settle down. And I had another experience of a person that could not sleep because of the anxiety. And that person could not sleep for two months. Two months. By the time, by the time they took this person to the doctor, they gave him some medication and she was able to sleep two hours a day with medication. But imagine two months without not being able to even be right because of anxiety. And when that person spoke with you, it was just not clear. It was just, you know, you think it was just gibberish and you just didn't understand what that person was saying. So, you know, it's, it's um, incredible to, um, to go through anxiety. So, <clears throat> how do we deal with anxiety? Somebody had asked, how do we deal with anxiety? Well, Daniel 3 has a solution to deal with anxiety. And we're going to look into it today. Let's go to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And let's start there. I'm going to wait for everybody to, to get there with me. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read from 1 to 7. 1 to 7. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar had a golden statue made. Whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, sorry, um, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriff, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out loud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear, the sound of the comet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the scimitar, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath 
set up and whose fall is not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sapbuck, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages, fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. So let's see what's going on in this story. The king decides to take an image, the, I guess the one that he had dreamed, you know, that we heard about the dream this morning and last night. He had set up an image, and it was 90 feet of gold, just of gold. Who would do something crazy like that? And then he did what? He said, I want to bring who? Everyone, but exactly who is specific he brought. The judges, the counselors, the governors. Who are these people? The chief people, the influencers, the high impact people. These are people that when they say something, people what? Follow their leaders. So he brought the leaders of his country and he said what? I'm going to play some music. Uh-huh. Play some music. And when I play this music, I want everybody to bow down to this image. Let me get the image from this morning. Remember this little guy here that somebody gave me. Right? You look... And it was different metals going on. Remember that? And why was the different metals represented? Different kingdoms. Now, who was the head of gold? Babylon. Babylon. Exactly. Babylon was the head of gold. So King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and he was the head of gold. He, but what was happening? The head of gold according to the interpretation of the dream, was going to be followed by another, what? Metal, which represented what? Another kingdom after him. Now, why would he go ahead and do this? He said, I'm going to set up this image, and this image is going to be all of gold. What message is he trying to give? My kingdom is not going to be followed by anyone, no matter what God has said on his dream. I'm going to set this up. I'm going to explain you why he did something as crazy as that. Because, hey, I can say my kingdom is not going to be replaced by no kingdom. But it's something I'm saying. There's got to be some reason behind, you know, the reasoning that I have to do something as crazy as building an image of gold of 90 feet. And then asking everyone to come and, and um, worship it. Well, it looks like, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to go to the board. And I'm going to show you something about history that was happening in this, at this time. Sorry. Yeah, let me get further back. Markers, hold up. Imagine that here we have Egypt. Here was Babylon. Here is Jerusalem. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, was on an enterprise here of conquering. Egypt had moved up here. Egypt was a powerful country at that time. And while he was here conquering, he heard about this news. So he sent part of the army here, kind of just to say, hey, what's going on? Don't touch, don't touch these waters. 
But as he's doing this, here in Babylon, there's an insurrection, a revolt happening in his own town. So, at that moment, he has to return from his enterprise back to Babylon to figure out what's going on. Now, what do you think came to his mind at that moment? When all these things are happening, what came to his mind? The dream. Another kingdom will come. Immediately, he reacts. You see, when you have anxiety, you don't think clearly. You don't think things clearly. You react to things. And his reaction was, let me just build a whole image of gold, meaning that, hey, no one is going to come after me. And on top of that, all my provinces, all my kingdom, every leader has to come here and bow down to this image. Now, I'll just make a statement clear. This, this dream, everybody knew about it, by the way. It just, it just spread. Because high influencers were going to die because of this dream, right? Remember the story? So now, um, everybody knew what the gold meant. The gold meant no one, listen to me, listen to me. No one is going to come after me. No one, okay? My kingdom is going to be safe. That's a reaction, right? Trying to say in a statement. Now, he used, as motivators, he used music. Music is a powerful, powerful, powerful um, influencer, motivator to make you do things. So when you think anxiety, think about music. The type of music you listen can change the way you react to anxiety. Okay, it's very important. Um... We're going to mention something about music on Friday, but I was going to give you a heads up that, you know, when you have music that has some beats on it, I'm not saying it's bad or wrong, I'm just saying the music with beats on them um, tend to actually not let the frontal lobe do its function, right? Melodious music actually is very healthy for the frontal lobe. Now, the frontal lobe is when you, ma you make clear decisions. It's where you make the decisions that are needed when you're in anxiety, okay? So if you have somebody with anxiety, make sure you put melodious music, harmonious music, which harp will be a good, good um, music. Flute is very, very melodious. The piano is very, so these, these, these type of music are very good to calm down. There's a story in the Bible of a king that he got anxiety. He, he, he had all these anxiety, and when he had all these anxiety, what would happen? He would call someone, and that person would play the harp, and when he played the harp, the guy can't calm down. Because that's melodious music. That's the effect that it has. So the king knew this, too. So that's why he bring music to motivate people to do what he wanted to do. I mean, if you have this loud music, you see people jumping up and down and doing things that really probably they won't do if they were without that music. You know, just, just giving you some, some pointers on this. Now, let's continue reading. We stayed at verse 8. Verse 8. Now, another, so, sorry, another motivator was the fiery furnace. If you, didn't, if you did not do or bow down to the image, you were going to be thrown where? In the fire. Okay. Now, verse 8, let's continue reading. Daniel chapter 3, verse 8. Wherefore, at the time... Certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree, 
that every man that shall hear the sound of the comet, the flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimeter, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he sound be cast into the midst of the burning fire furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. The king was livid. He was, he, these people are challenged my, my authority. And that's why he was had so much anxiety, because people were challenging his authority to begin with. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, there's a common word that it's coming in this verse. What is it? Anybody knows? Set up. Yes, set up. It's the same word all the time. Good. Now, if ye be ready that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and dulcimeter, and all kinds of music, ye shall fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you, ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you from, from my hands? Hmm. Saying, I want to see the God that can deliver you from the hands, from my hands. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now, these, these young men had... Um, had the courage to challenge the authority of the king. What motivated them to go as far as challenging the, the, wills, the will of the king and actually also endanger their own lives? What can motivate someone to do something like that? Right, so when you decide to, to um, um, obey God's laws and when man's laws come interpose and come in the between, you have to make a line and say, you know, that's it, that's it. Yes, that's, that's, that's a strong thing, you know. That's a strong thing to make that decision, to be that committed to your, to your belief system. That is very committed. Um, I mean, each of us at one point in our lives, we, we have to have some, some commitments and know what's right and what's wrong, and we have to say, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. Maybe it's at your job. They say, you know what, can you cheat these numbers a little bit to make things work better? Your integrity is challenged there. And you say, it's your job that you depend on, or, or, or you just break, you know, your, your commitment to God, your integrity. You have to make decisions like that all the time. You know, and these, these young men decided to make that decision. Now, what motivated them? That was one motivator. Another motivator they had was what? Past experiences, you know, they have seen the hand of God in their lives. And they have trusted Him. They have seen before what it could happen. 
Um, another thing was faith. Faith in what God has said that, hey, don't, don't be afraid of the king of, of, of the north, king of Babylon, because he's not going to touch you. That was some, some words of the prophet that they kept in their minds. Now, they make a, a stand of faith. Have you ever made a stand of faith where you have said, you know what, no matter what, everybody, all the world, all the, everyone, the world is telling me one thing, but I'm just going to stand still. Of, I'm going to put my, my stand of faith and I'm going to stand up and do this. And you see the waves coming at you. And everybody says, you will never do it. That's it. You, you, you're crazy for doing this. You'll never make it this way. And you say, no, I'm going to make a stand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a, my feet on faith that God is going to be with me. Have you ever done something like this? This is what they did. This is what they did. Look what happened. Verse 19, then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, his face, this figure of rage. It says, therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was one beat, um, I mean, sorry, seven times more than it was um, to be heated. So now, he said, they took a stand of faith, and what was their response to their faith? The fire got seven times hotter. You know, you've been praying for something in your life and say, God, please, you know, I have this problem, I want to give it to you. I want to put it in your hands. And as soon as you wake up, you receive the news. And it's seven times worse than where you started. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? You see, when you suffer from anxiety, that would destroy you. That should destroy you. You committed yourself to God. You say, God, I'm going to stand with you. You get up from your prayer. And as soon as you get up from your prayer, the heat got seven times hotter. What do you do then? You see, God wanted to show the king how to deal with anxiety. You see, when... When the problems are about yourself, when, it, when the problems are about you, when things are about you, you have, a, you have reasons to be afraid and fear and, and, and get really, really sad and worry about things. But you see, your life and your problems are not about you. And they understood this. Look, verse 20, the fire got seven times hotter. God is showing the king how to deal with anxiety. Verse 20. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them in the burning, fiery furnace. Now, I, never, I, never saw, I never put attention to this. He says that he commanded the, mighty, the most mighty men. That means that he, the, 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 huh? Captain. The captains, they're really, you know, I bet the stronger, the mighty of all of them were the ones that were taking these, binding them. I mean, I, I bet they weren't doing it softly. They were doing it with like, uh, you know, showing, you know, their authority. Just like policemen, you know. I got recently stopped by a policeman, thank God. That wasn't something that I was doing wrong, but he was actually sending me somewhere that I needed to go. And as soon as he gets out of the car, he gets like this, and he gets like this, and he gets his pants on and, you know, up, 
and he goes towards me. I don't know why they do that all the time. I always look at it and I always see that reaction. It's like they're, they have their gun and it's falling, their pants are falling. Maybe so. I think it's a sign of authority, you know, I'm just, I'm the law, right? So I'm assuming these men were like, yeah, you know, going towards these other young men, binding them, and they're going to throw them in the fire furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments. So they were well dressed. I think this was a good activity. A, you know, it's an important activity. So they were well dressed. And were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At this moment, you know, there's this big golden image, huge golden image. I mean, when you see something that shiny, you look at it. You'll, you'll, wow, you know, you're admiring it. Everyone is looking at the scene right here. It is high definition, 4K. It's in their eyes. They're seeing this, and their attention is to these men. They're like, everything is pointing to them. It says that when these men were taking them in, a fire came, this mighty man, and just slew them. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's verse 23, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So they fell into the furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So this man knew something. This Nebuchadnezzar knew something. How did he know that the fourth one that appeared there could be the Son of God? It probably was shiny. Or he had some knowledge that these um, young men had told, them, told him. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fire furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And verse 27, And the prince, governors, and captains, and the kings, Counselor, being gathered together, saw these men, upon whose body the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head signed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed them. This is my favorite verse on the whole story. You know, they had reasons to have anxiety. Because their life was in danger of death. You see, how much anxiety can somebody have when you're going to die immediately? But you know the reason they had no anxiety? is because of this verse. This verse explains it very well. There was not a smell of fire. Even the smoke, they didn't smell like smoke. What does that mean to me? It means that it was never about them. It was not about them. Had nothing to do about them. If it was about them, you would have seen them, No! No! I don't want to go in! But it was not about them. It was about God. You see, God wants to show Himself in your life. And through your trials, it's going to be a testimony for Him and for others. That's what it's about. When we have problems, sometimes if it's about us, we're like, oh, please help me. I have all these problems, and everybody pray for me. Do this for me. Ah. Everybody knows. And we're like, oh, that's all you talk about because it's about you. 
But you know what? It's not about you. If it's about you, you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have, you're going to be concerned. But it's not about you. It was never about them. It was about the God they served. And that's why they didn't even smell like fire. Nobody, if, if someone has not been there and saw, um, seen what has happened, they have never knew that they were in the fire. Because they didn't smell like fire. Their clothes were not burned. Nothing had happened. It was not about them. Let's continue. Let me show you. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servant that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Verse 29, Therefore I make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill, because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. You see, it was about God. It was not about them. I'll tell you, there's a, there's a person that came once, and, you know, it's a miracle how it all happened. And I remember this story well because when that person came here, he, um, I mean, he had a drug addiction problems, alcohol problems, and, and he was very, you know, away from, from the group. But at the end, he said, you know what? I'm going to give myself, I want to commit myself to my family, my children, my wife. I want to commit myself to God. And I'm going to leave all these things. The, the old person that, was, that came here is going to stay here. I'm going to be a different person. And he left. And that was a powerful testimony in itself. Well, there was a better, uh, even more powerful testimony. Because of his because of his habits, he um, he um, he had some DUIs in his record, and he never showed up to court. So they were looking for him. There were a couple of them, so they were looking for him, and um, they were going to deport him. Right. So he, um, he left this place, and I remember two weeks after he left his place, he sent me a periscope. It's like a, it's like a platform to, to actually um, stream or, you know, like Skype or things like that. And he had a meeting in his house to tell everyone about his change, how God changed his life. And in there, he's telling them about how he doesn't eat meat anymore, and how it is th he's juicing, how he needs to exercise. And he's telling everybody, you have to exercise. And he sends it to me so I can see what's the first, his first meeting. He was going to do many meetings of this. So this is his first meeting. And everybody, you could see everybody saying, wow, in two weeks and you're not going to eat meat anymore? Wow. And he said, well, wait a second. I, I, I did eat meat after I came to the wellness, from the wellness center. You know, I was coming from work, and I, there's these chicken that I used to stop and eat. And I went in, and I, I stopped one day. And I was eating this chicken, you know, and some bone came into the top of my, my, um, the, the top of my mouth, and it just, it just pain, it was very painful. And the chicken didn't taste it the same as he used to. I used to love it. You know what I remember that at that moment? That broth that Maria made. Oh, I wish I had that broth right now. And that was so funny to me that he's talking to these people. And they're, everybody's like, unbelievable. This guy, how could he be just changed like that? And he's so excited about telling these things. Well, that's not all. The police catch him. 
They were waiting for him. He comes out of work or something. They catch him, put him in the car. And he's a changed man. He says, you know what? He told, I have a land in my country, and I'm building a house there. I, I need to go back to tell my family and everyone what has happened in my life. They don't eat right. They don't have any connections to God. They're just missing out. So I got to go there and tell them. So he's relaxed because it's not about him. And he had a pocket Bible, and he's in the police car. He's reading. He's relaxed. Nothing happened. You know, he's going to be separated from his family, but he's, he's okay. He says, you know what? I, I really want to go home and, and do this. And while he's in there, the policeman looked at him. He says, what are you doing? He says, um, no, nothing. I'm just reading. I'm just reading the Bible. He says, what? Seriously? And they start talking. And after the conversation, the police just stopped, op opened the door, and says, just, just go. Get out. Get out. Just, just leave. It's like, wow. You know, it, it, from that story, I just see, you know, it, it's not about you. When you make it about you, your problems, you know, God cannot work through you and, and manifest what he wants to to others, to change the life of other people. So, you know, to deal with anxiety, it's easy when it doesn't make it about you. Just leave it somebody else's hands, and it, it works. It always works. So, hope that, um, that you've been blessed. And um, we're going to continue with Daniel. There's a lot of stories and a lot of um, lessons that we can learn from the book of Daniel. So... Thank you very much, and let's have a great night tonight.